Welcome, everyone. If you got here a little late, my name is Pastor Greg, and we're so excited to have you here today. You picked a great week to come as we are right in the middle of a series. Uh, this series that you see uh, reflected in the banner behind me, Angry Words. And what we're doing in this series is that we're truly understanding the power in what we say and how that has the power to affect us. And let me tell you, it's really cool. I get a lot of good feedback throughout the uh, week, and this week is, is like no other. I got some good feedback about this message, but there was sort of an interesting uh, response from the person I talked to. The person told me, when you were sharing in your message, this was last week's message if you were here, I wanted to leave the building. I was like, dude, are you serious? Uh, what's up, man? You know, is that a compliment? or, or is And he, he said, the, God was working on me so much with the words that were coming forth that I just wanted to run and I wanted to escape. He is like, but I couldn't do it because God kept speaking in my heart. There's something here for you to learn. There's something here for you to hear. And he said, I didn't run out, I didn't leave, and I stayed, and God spoke through that message last week. And I just want to encourage you. I know it's difficult sometimes when we look at sort of where we are in the truth of sometimes those things that we believe about ourselves, and sometimes when we see that the lies that we've been believing are not true. And it's difficult, but allow yourself to go through it because God can speak through it. Because today, what we're going to begin to do is we're going to begin to see how do we attack these weeds that have been growing inside of our lives. So today, we're going to get down and dirty. Let me tell you, before it's all said and done, some angry birds are going to fly. All right, I'm just telling you how it's going to go. I'm warning you. Now, that's, don't worry, no one's in the front row, so you guys will be safe. <laughs> that's always that way. All right, you grab your Bibles, open up to the Bible, and uh, we're going to get into the book of Matthew. All right, so it's really important. I stress it every week. Sometimes people listen, sometimes they don't, but I want to see you guys in the Word of God. The Word of God is the only thing that has the power to bring manifest change in your life. I know sometimes I make it easy on you because I got it all up here, but there's something powerful when you open up to it and you see it with your own eyes. So I'm going to continue to encourage you guys, grab that Bible, open it up to the book of Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, we're going to start in verse 13. 16, 13, and Matthew says this, when Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi. Now let me tell you, that verse right there has great depth and great meaning. Like Right now, Jesus had been traveling around, and uh, you know he doesn't have a cab, right? He's, he's walking around, and he's traveling far distances everywhere he goes. And uh, we see from the previous uh, chapter some of the places that he's been. I mean, just look back at Matthew 15, verse 21. It says, Jesus left that place. And he went to the area of Tyre and Sidon. So he's up in this one area. And then it tells us just a couple verses later in, in verse 29. After leaving there, Jesus went along the shore of Galilee. And then if we read just a, a, a few verses later in verse 39, it says, Then Jesus got into the boat and he went to the area of Magadan. And so we see that he's traveling all around. And, and we hear that, but it doesn't really make sense until we really see it. And if we saw it, here's what it would look like on a map in just these few verses in Matthew 15. He starts up here in that, that area, right in that area, right there on the coast. That's where we sort of started that journey. And then it tells us that he traveled. Now, look at the distance that he traveled. He traveled all the way down to the Sea of Galilee. So he's walking. He traveled all that way. Now, when he's at the Sea of Galilee, it said that next place was, was Magadan that he went to. And that area is right there on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. But then we read that verse we just looked at, and it said that he traveled to the area of Caesarea Philippi. And now I want you to look at the distance from the Sea of Galilee all the way up to Caesarea Philippi. That's like 30 miles and I know now for you guys, maybe that's a trip to Walmart, but for Jesus, that's a, that's a far distance, all right? I mean, traveling 30 miles, walking, right, with his friends, with people around him, he's got to travel all the way up to this area of Caesarea Philippi, and his belief, the people that were following him and his disciples probably were wondering, why on earth are we going to this place? See, because even though it, it looked nice, I mean, when you went there, Caesarea Philippi, there was water there, which was really nice. In fact, it was where the Jordan River started. It was sort of the mouth of the Jordan River. But this area, Caesarea Philippi, was actually a place of pagan worship. In fact, people traveled from all over to worship these false idols and gods. 
And what they would do in this area of Caesarea Philippi, you can see these, little, these things. This is a, an actual picture of what Caesarea Philippi looks like. You can see these notches that are cut out inside of the wall. You see it like right there? And what people would do is they would place these gods, like these idols, right, these, the, these false gods, and they would put them up in these crevices and these rocks in Caesarea Philippi, and they would travel long distances, and they would go there to worship these false gods. This is what this area was known for. Not only that, probably the biggest attraction in Caesarea Philippi was known as the Grotto of Pan. Now, Pan was a, a false god. Like, you guys may even heard of Pan before. You know, he's got sort of the animal legs and little horns, looks a little like a devil. Uh, that was Pan, right? But he was the god of the wilderness, they would say. But especially with Pan, he was sort of like this god of fertility. So watch this. People would travel all over to this area right here. They would travel from all over to worship this god named Pan. And when they would travel to get to them, what they would do is they would take place in these weird, deviant, sexual rituals because he was this god of fertility. And so they would travel from all over and they would partake in this thing right by this place, this grotto of Pan. Now, I tell you all that because you have to realize that Jesus is a Jewish religious man telling his followers, come on, guys, let's go to the grotto of Pan. Does that make sense now? So now when we read that Jesus is taking his people to Caesarea Philippi, now it makes a little more sense. So they're like, say what? Caesarea Philippi, man, we ain't going there. Like Vegas. Uh, you know, it'd it be just, <laughs> sorry. Lord. Uh, so he's traveling, right? But he says, come on, guys, this is where we're going. And it's interesting that he would pick this place for what is about to happen. I, I don't think it's, it, it's not an accident that he would walk 30 miles to get to Caesarea Philippi to have the conversation that he's about to have. We see the conversation starting in verse 13 of chapter 16 where it says this, When Jesus came to the area of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his followers, so the people that were following him, right, he asked them, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They answered, some say you are John the Baptist, others say you are Elijah, and still others say you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked them, and who do you say that I am? I need you to hear that because he said, who do you say that I am? It's almost like he's saying, what's my name? And if you remember, if you were here last week, we talked a little bit about the name because we looked at Jacob, whose name meant deceiver, who's wrestling an angelic being. And, and that same thing happens when he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And he looks at him and says, what's your name? See that? And he had to look eye to eye and he had to say, you know what? I'm a deceiver. That's who I am. My name's Jacob. I'm a deceiver. And, and God moved in the midst of that moment and said, no more are you going to be called a deceiver. No, your name now is Israel. And Israel means, yes, prince of God. They were listening. Yes, prince of God, right? So he says, you are no longer a deceiver. You are a prince of God. Now God, now Jesus travels with all of his followers that he goes to this place where all these idols are worshiped on a regular basis. Imagine the backdrop of this conversation. He's standing before this rock in this big body of water where people do all these deviant sexual acts and all these false gods that are being worshiped. And now he stands up before his believers and says, who do you say that I am? You got all these false idols and all these false gods to worship. Who do you say that I am in your life? And the interesting part about Jesus is when Jesus is speaking this to his disciples, he doesn't care what anyone else thinks. He doesn't care what they're saying on the evening news. He doesn't care what pop culture thinks about them. He wants to know what do they think of him. Who did they say that he was? And I'm going to tell you it's the same thing today. I don't care what CNN thinks about Jesus Christ, and he doesn't care either. Sorry, he doesn't. He doesn't care what your mama thinks about Jesus Christ either when he's looking you in your eyes, looking at you, saying, what do you say about me? Who do you say that I am? Because there's going to come a day, guess what, when everything's going to be stripped away from you and you're going to stand face to face before God, there's going to be nobody there. You're not going to be able to stand on the shoulders of your grandparents' faith before God. You're not going to be able to say, well, Pastor Greg said, it doesn't matter. I ain't going to be there. I got my own meeting with him. And you ain't going to be at my meeting either. And so I need to know that my faith isn't built upon you and your faith isn't built upon me, but our faith is built on Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. 
So he's looking at them. He's saying, who do you say that I am? Now, I got to tell you, in our life, yeah, we probably don't have little statues that we bow down and worship, but I got to tell you that there's idols in our lives too. I got to say, in the same way that he could go to Caesarea Philippi, that Jesus could travel to Wickenburg and find people that bow down to worship idols. It happens. It's not a statue, but it's a thing. For example, I, I come across people all the time that bow down to worship the God of money, where money and finances becomes that which they worship. If two things are faced to them between this area of money or something else, that money will always win out. Money is the God that they worship. And so they bow down and they worship him. What, how, how do you know if that's a God that you worship? If, if it comes between God and money, that you're going to pick money. The Bible refers to it as mammon. Would that be your first choice? What's your first choice in life? We see it all the time. Maybe it's not money. Maybe you're like, ah, that's not my problem. I run into people all the time. They may not bow down to the God of money, but they bow down to the God of success. They just want to succeed. They just want to make something of their life. And that desire to, of success causes their love of God to wane and that rise for success to win out. And before you know it, and we've seen this. I actually talked about this a little while ago. When, when you see some uh, uh, musicians that started out at, in churches worshiping Jesus, right? Gain their popularity singing songs to Jesus. I talked about Katy Perry when her first album was a Christian album. And then you find that this success, so in her life, you know, and if Katie wants to debate me on this, she can. Uh, in, in, in her life, this, when success increased, Jesus decreased. Who's her God? Who's her God? In our life, it's the same thing. In our life, if, if, if we love Jesus now, and success increases and our love of Jesus decreases, well, we have a new God that we're worshiping. And we have to realize what God are we worshiping in our life? For some of us, it may not be money, it may not be success, it may just be the God of self. I worship me. It's all about me. That's what our culture is all about, right? Feels good, do it. Lolo, what is it? Lolo or Lola? YOLO, YOLO, right? I don't know what it is. And I'm glad. You only live once, right? That's the big thing out there. YOLO, you know, only live once. Do whatever you want, right? Live for today. It's all about that. What is that? I worship the God called me. I worship myself. If I want to do it, I'm going to do it. If it feels right, I'm going to do it. I don't care what anybody says. YOLO, right? And so we have this attitude of our life and our culture. Well, what are you doing? That's self-worship. That's saying you come before anybody else. And you come before God. So that if the question comes whether you want it or God wants it, guess who wins every time? You, right? It's what you want, not what he wants. If we do that, it's a very, very dangerous place to be that we have to realize who are we truly worshiping. Are we worshiping ourselves, or are we worshiping him? For some of us, it may not be money. It may not be success. It may not be self-worship. It just may be sex. Sort of our culture, right? It's out there on a regular basis. This idea of sex, 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 you know? And, and when you find yourself continually being drawn into this area and not caring about what God says, but saying, you know what? It's all about me. It's whatever I want. That, that becomes something that we worship. It may not be a little statue, but we can still worship these things in our life. And what happens is that these things get in the way of our relationship with Jesus. They, they mess things up. And so I think Jesus, when he's standing with all these idols behind him and he's speaking out to, to his disciples, he's saying, who do you say that I am? Am I a figurine that you're going to put up and you're going to worship me? Or am I the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords? Am I above all of this in your life? And I think he would do the same thing today. When it comes to self-worship, when it comes to money, when it comes to success, when it comes to sex, is he above all of that things? Is he the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords? Because that's the place that he demands. Now, Peter gets it right this time. Peter's always the first to speak. He doesn't always get it right, but this time he does, all right? Peter speaks up in verse 16. Listen to what he says. He says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ. He said, you are the son of the living God. That's a profound statement. He's looking at Jesus and saying, Jesus, you are everything. You are the beginning. You are the end. You are the all-sufficient one. I need nothing else because I have you. You are the Messiah. You are the very person that humanity has been waiting for. And here you are present in the midst of this moment. I need nothing else because I have you. When you say he's the Messiah, that's what you're saying. You need nothing else because you have him. And that's what, that's what Simon Peter said. 
Peter got down and he surrendered and said, God, it's all about you. Jesus, you are the Messiah. Jesus, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords in my life. And today I choose to worship you and I will worship you every single day. And all of these gods can be torn down and thrown away as long as I have you. That's the only thing that matters. Think about that in your life. Is that the only thing that matters? If everything was ripped and torn down, but you still had Jesus, would that be enough? If that would be enough, then, then he's your Messiah. If that would be enough, then he is the king of kings in your life. And that's the place that he always wants us to be. And the thing is, he's going to bless you. Even as we saw him, but as he blesses you, you have to say, Jesus, you are always first. If I have this thing, if I have this opportunity, if I have this position, or if I don't, you're still the king of my life. That's what it means when he's the Messiah. Now, Jesus answers in verse 17. He says this, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah. Because no person taught you that. My Father in heaven showed you who I am. So I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the power of death will not be able to defeat it. Now, this is interesting. This is an interesting verse here because some believe that Jesus says, you are Peter, and because Peter's name meant the rock, that upon the the back of Peter that the church would be built. There's a problem with that, however, because the wording that he uses. I mean, if you trace it all the way back to the Greek here, when he talks to Peter, Petras uh, is Peter's name. And then he says, and upon this Petra, rock, right? Rock. I'm going to build. what is the rock? It's not a person. It's not the apostle. It's the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. He says, upon this rock, this uh, fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah of mankind, upon that rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In other words, all powerful church will be built upon the truth that Jesus is that Messiah. And he goes on to say this. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The things you don't allow on earth will be the things that God does not allow. And the things that you allow on earth will be the things that God allows. Then Jesus warned his followers not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. I got to tell you, this verse right here is a powerful verse. He's sitting here saying, the things that you allow, I'm going to allow. The things you disallow, I'm not going to allow. But I got to tell you, when we look at it through the view of this series that we've been talking about, is that we've been looking at the words, the seeds that have been planted in our heart and life that have been growing now to epic proportions to take over every single part of our life. Those words have begun to grow. Now, I know some of you have allowed these words to grow, and then you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, can't you just get rid of them already? Right? I mean, you've been there. I mean, Jesus, if you can do everything, why can I just not see myself as worthless anymore? Why can't it just happen? Why can't you just wiggle your nose and make it done like I dream a genie? Come on now. Why can't you do something like that? I mean, you're you're able to do everything. Why can't you just fix that area of my life, that way that I see myself? Well, I think it's interesting when we see what he said here that there's some things, right, that we allow in our lives that he allows too. And things that we disallow in our lives that he disallows too. And I believe that he's trying to teach us in the midst of this moment that there's things that have been growing, these thoughts and these seeds that have been growing inside of our life that we have the power to get rid of, but we have to do something. It's more than wiggling our nose that we have to become actively engaged to extricate these things that we no longer want in our life. Now, let let me bring it back to last week's story. Last week, we talked about Jacob. We saw Jacob wrestling with God, and we saw everything that he was part of. And then we heard God speak, right, through the person who was wrestling, the angel that was wrestling Jacob, and speaks to him and says, what's your name? And he says, my name's Jacob. And he says, no longer is your name Jacob. Your name is Israel, and Israel means prince of god he says once you were a deceiver you're no longer a deceiver now you are a prince of god he leaves the midst of that moment and the bible tells us really interesting in genesis 33 that he goes back to his brother now when he went back to his brother remember he deceived his brother and it's pretty interesting because when he went back to his brother he went back as jacob hey how's it going jacob doing great yeah hey my name is jacob nice to meet you i've been away for a while it's good to be home he went back as jacob And tragedy follows his life. 
Jacob, thir- uh, you see this in Genesis 33. If you get, and I wish we could go there, but we can't go there. But this is reading uh, homework for you guys this week. Genesis 34 is filled with tragedy, rape, and murder in Jacob's family, in his life. His daughter gets raped by someone, right? Next thing you know, the brothers are like, say what? That ain't going to happen. They try to get dad to do something. Dad doesn't do anything, so they get a posse. They go in. They kill an entire city, an entire city, right? They kill them, everyone, all the guys, and they take all the ladies and all the stuff, right? And then Jacob's got to be looking around thinking, what is going on? His family, this is his family, Horrible things are happening to his children. His children are behaving like this. How is everything falling apart? I don't know, man. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you're at that place where you feel that. You know, you were here last week. I speak to you about your name being changed, and then you go back, and all H-E double hockey stick breaks loose. I don't know. I didn't cuss. That's in the Bible. Um, You don't know. I, I don't know what happened to you, but I know that's what happened to Jacob. I know Jacob went home, and he's probably looking around thinking to himself, man, what happened? He had this moment with God, and then he goes back, and everything begins to fall apart. Well, the cool thing for us is in Genesis 35, God shows back up in Jacob's life. And God shows up, Genesis 35, verse 1, says this, God said to Jacob, go to the city of Bethel and live there. Make an altar, watch this, to the God who appeared to you there when you were running away from your brother Esau. God speaks to Jacob in the midst of his chaos to remind him of a moment where he was spoken to about his identity. You see that? He showed up in the midst of this and brought him back and said, I need you to go back to this place to remember what was spoken over your life. And then if we looked a couple verses later, and he goes back to that place, and he does that, and then he ends up coming back, and it tells us in verses 9 and 10, check this out. It says, when Jacob came back from northwest Mesopotamia, God appeared to him again and blessed him. Listen to what God said. God said, your name is Jacob, but you will not be called Jacob any longer. I thought he already had that conversation once in his life. Well, he did, but everything just sort of slipped back. God called him back. Remember what was spoken over your life. Now let me reiterate that and speak that over. And I love how he speaks. He says, you will not be called Jacob any longer. From this moment on, I don't want you to introduce yourself as Jacob. You're not Jacob. When you look in the mirror, I can't have you see Jacob anymore. Jacob is dead. Israel is alive. Your new name will be Israel. And so watch this. So he called him Israel. Who called him Israel? God called him Israel. Do you see that? He called him Israel. God called him Jacob Israel. Now what does that mean for you? When I'm talking about your new identity and who you are in Christ, God calls you that. You say, I don't feel like a new creation. I don't care what you feel like. God said you're a new creation. I, I don't feel like I'm set free. I don't care what you feel like. God said you're set free. You see the difference in attitude? We need to stop as a church operating according to our feelings and start operating according to faith. This is a different place to be. I said, I don't care what I feel like if God's word says that it's true and I'm going to operate according to faith in this situation. See, God called him Israel. So he said, no longer can I, can I be called Jacob. His name was changed. And I got to tell you that God looked at Jacob in all of his mistakes. In the eyes of the world, Jacob is a bad person. He's a bad father. He's a bad son. He's a liar. He's a bad man. But in the eyes of God, watch this, he is a prince. And everything changes in that moment when he looks at him and says, you are Israel. In my eyes, you are Israel. In my eyes, you are a new creation. You need to hear that today. Because when you look in the mirror, you don't see that new creation. But when God looks at you, he's already spoken it. And you need to start believing what he said about you. Not believe in what your parents said about you. Not believe in what the people that hurt you said about you. Not even believe in what you think about yourself, but believe in what he said about you because that's the only thing that's true in your life. Now, it goes on to tell us in verse 11, it says, God said to him, I am God Almighty. Have many children. He's talking to Israel. Notice I didn't say Jacob. He's talking to Israel, and he says, have many children and grow in number as a nation. You will be the ancestor of many nations and kings. The same land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I'm going to give to you and your descendants. And then God left him. God spoke a blessing in his life and says, listen, no longer are you going to be Jacob. You are Israel. You are blessed today. But look at this. Not only are you blessed today, but you're blessed tomorrow. 
There's a vision. There's a direction for your life. There's a place that I'm taking you, but you've got to grab onto this. You need to let this Jacob thing go. In order to be the person that I've called you to be and accomplish what I've called you, you need, you need to let it go. And when you look in that mirror, you need to see yourself as Israel and start operating as Israel in the way that you live. Same thing is true in us today. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? Do you see who God sees? That's a, that's a question. Do you see who God sees? You've got to answer that in your own heart. Now, what we've looked at today is first, Jesus is the Messiah and the rock that everything else is built on. Next, we learn that whatever we allow to grow in our lives will grow. We have power over what, what is growing inside of our lives. And next, it's easy to slip back into our old way of thinking. It was easy for Jacob. It's easy for you. So we've got to figure out, if it's easy to do that, how do I have victory in this area? Finally, to exterminate these lies that have been planted and growing in your life, you have to attack them. And the only thing that can defeat a lie is truth. Right? The only thing that can defeat a lie is truth. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you guys the game plan for your life. So you got to figure out your box, what's your box, what's your lie. Is it the belief that you're greedy, worthless, messed up, forgotten, selfish, addict, or maybe you got your own. I don't know what it is. But whatever it is, to attack, we have to understand what is the lie that we are believing about ourselves that isn't true. Okay? So you need to think about that. What is the lie? What's the number one lie in my life that I'm believing to be true that's not true, okay? Once we figure out exactly what that is, okay, this is a lie, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to get a weapon. Now, the only weapon that we have to use is the Bible, God's Word. It is alive, living, and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing, remember we talked about this, between soul and spirit, between the way that we feel and the way that things really are. You know, it separates between the, those two things. So we have to come up with scripture that is going to attack that lie, okay? That's the weapon that we use. And then we attack, right? Then we come after that thing. There's vehicles that we use. And I'm going I'm to teach you guys three vehicles to use today. And then you guys are going to be sent out to actually do what you're learning. So you don't want to be sleeping in this part. You got to hear this because this has the power to change your life forever. And if you allow yourself to identify the lie, uh, choose your weapon wisely and attack, then, uh, then you'll reach this place of victory. Then this area of your life, whatever it is, that you will be victorious glorious over it okay now okay let me give you a good example i'm worthless some of you guys may feel that way i talked to a guy this week he said his dad spoke over his life you're worthless on a regular basis he says when i said those words it put it it, it put a chill through his bones like he understood exactly what that meant because it was just like his dad was speaking it over and he was taken back to that place some of you guys right here you feel worthless like, man, I've, I've, I, I just don't feel like I'm worthy. I don't feel like I'm worth anything. Well, if you're there, I'm going to give you guys a couple tools, okay? So if you're here, you want to grab your pen because you, you're going to write this down. The weapon for you, if you feel worthless, would be two verses. The first verse would be Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope, and plans to give you a future. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. The other verse for you is uh, Psalm 139.14. 139.14, that says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, that you were created for a purpose, right? That God created you, that you're not worthless. And if you're created being of God, then you are worth something. Does that make sense? And so you, you take these. And, and so a good example of how we could attack is, is for that, we could just recite those verses, speak those verses out. So you take those verses and you put them in your pocket. You carry them around. You know, you're waiting for the elevator. Wait, that probably won't happen much around here. Uh, you know, you're waiting in line at Safeway. And, uh, you, you know, you just begin to recite these, right? Maybe, maybe you're driving. That wouldn't be a good idea either. Um, you know, driving, uh, trying. Uh, maybe you're standing outside the church uh, before you come in and you just speak these things out. Or, or maybe you're waiting in line. How about this? Maybe you're sitting in the car waiting for somebody to come out of church. There you go. And, and you're just sitting there and you just begin to recite these verses. And then you put them back in your pocket. And then you wait. And then you're on lunch break, right? You sit down for lunch break. You pull that out, man. You set them out. And you just, I am, I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a plan and a purpose for my life. And you put them back in. Maybe every time that you get this feeling, I'm worthless. You'd be like, oh man, you know, I feel worthless. But man, your word says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, so that must not be true. And you begin attacking, 
right? You begin attacking. Now, we need to sort of vividly see what this looks like. Dylan, will you come up here? So you begin to attack these things that are going on. Now, for us, we're using sort of this idea of these, these cute little birds, right? So what we can do is that we can take this, this and we begin to attack these false thoughts. You guys want to see if you can do it? <laughs> Absolutely, man. All right, so we, we, we take this and, and we re begin to recite these. Now we feel, I feel like I'm worthless, but now I'm taking God's word and I'm reciting it over my life. And this is sort of vividly what it'll look like, I hope. <laughs> yeah! Whoa! <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> So what, what ends up happening, boom, that area is hit. I'm attacking that area, and now I begin to feel worthy. I begin to feel worth in my life because I've taken God's word, and I've attacked that area, and I said, I'm not going to let that continue to grow in my life anymore. I'm attacking it on a regular basis, and before you know it, when that idea comes in, I'm worthless, guess what? Immediately. No, I'm not. I know I'm not. You know, that part changes inside of your life. It's this powerful and radical change that happens, but it takes work to allow us to get there. All right, I'll give you another example. Maybe you're here today and, and you don't feel worthless, but maybe you feel like you messed up too bad. Maybe you feel like you made too many mistakes. Maybe you feel like you were once in the good graces of God, but man, you are, so, you are so far from him that there's no way that he could ever bring you back. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, I've just messed up too bad for God to ever use me. Well, I'm going to give you a couple verses, all right? Maybe Jeremiah 31, 34. It says, their sins and the evil thing they do, I will not remember anymore. That's a good one right there. You write that, highlight that, underline, tattoo backwards on your forehead. <laughs> Read it every time you look in the mirror. Uh, whatever you want. Uh, Psalm 103, 12 says this, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's good. So now this idea, I've messed up too bad, right? So we get this thought into our mind, I messed up too bad. And then we begin to attack that, right? We begin to say, oh, but you said you won't remember that thing that which I did that I messed up on. So if, if there's, that takes the power away from it. If you can't even remember it, if you've taken it as far as the east is from the west, then why am I sitting here beating myself up over this right now? You're not thinking about it. Why am I thinking about it? I'll give you another good idea. So reciting the verses, that was an idea. Well, here's another one. Maybe you take these two verses and you make them your screensaver on your computer. Maybe if you work in front of a computer a lot, you set your screensaver so at two minutes, man, that thing will go. So that, those verses are running all the time in front of you. If you sit in front of the computer, you're just seeing them over and over and over again. And before you know it, sort of that idea that comes up, I messed up too bad. When you get that thought, God's word sort of comes inside of your life and just begins to attack that area. You think you can do it? He was one for two last service. Let's see if he's, uh, <laughs> and begins to attack that area. I'm worthless. I'm greedy. I'm forgotten. Whatever it is, I've messed up too bad. So we, <laughs> he's getting some words of advice. And, and, and so we see that area. We take that and we, yeah, we just come and we attack that area. We say, man, no more. Oh, dude, sorry. <laughs> Are we going to allow that thing to grow in our lives? We're attacking it with God's word. You see what I mean? And, and then we begin to see ourselves as a child of God. I come in that feeling, oh, I messed up too bad. But your word says that you've taken as far as the east is from the, uh, the west, that it's completely gone, that I am a child of God and forgiven. You see that? What, you're uprooting that thing and saying, no longer am I going to let you grow in my heart or in my life. That's practically, actively staying engaged with God's word and what it means. I'll, I'll give you guys one more. Maybe you're here today, and you're saying, well, you know, it's not any of those things. I'm just hopeless. I feel like there's no hope. I feel like I don't have a future. I don't feel there's no direction. There's no way out. I feel like I'm in the quicksand. I feel like there's no way that I can ever escape from where I am. I just feel like I'm hopeless. Well, you could take the weapon. You know, I'll give you just a couple. I mean, the Bible's filled with them. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. We see this direct correlation between faith and hope and working together for the conviction of things not seen. We see Job eleven eighteen that says this, you will be secure because there is hope. You will look about you and you will take your rest in safety. You take these two verses, right, and you begin to believe them over your life. I feel hopeless, God, but your word says that I'm secure. 
because you give me hope so I can be secure in who I am. And, and, and what maybe for these two verses, you take them, and we talked about pulling them out of our pocket, and we also talked about our screensaver, but maybe these are two that you memorize. That's a powerful thing. When you memorize God's word, as soon as that thought comes, bam, you're ready for it. And you got to know in your life, man, what you have to be ready for. And when you memorize that, man, when that comes up, you instantly recite that. I got verses in my life. Job 31.1, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. Bam! Just like that. You don't, I don't have to think if that's right. I know God's word. It's in my heart, and it'll come right out of my mouth because that has the power like a sword to destroy the enemy. So when I find myself any time moving outside of what God wants, I'll take a scripture, and I'll say, that's a scripture I'm going to memorize, and I'm going to live this thing out because I need that one hidden in my heart. There's things in your guy's life, those are scriptures you need hidden in your heart. You gotta find them, you gotta get them, you gotta deposit them there. So you memorize that, and before you know it, you find yourself sensing hope inside of your life. I'm not hopeless anymore. I know that I'm free. Maybe some of you guys, you feel like you're in bondage, like you can't be free. The Bible says, you know, who the sun sets free is free indeed. You get that verse on the inside of you and said, man, I feel like I'm in bondage. I feel like I can't get out. But your word says, Lord. You see that? You just repeat it right back at him. I don't believe it, but you said it, so now I got to believe it. You know? You just begin to walk down that road. See, that's how we attack these things that, 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 that have been growing on the inside of us. And the true part is, is that we can have freedom. But I want you guys to see this. You only have freedom when you apply what God's word says. There's a difference between knowing and doing. You know, the Bible talks about that. You know, there's this interesting portion of scripture where where he makes the difference between knowing and doing he talks about building a a building and he talks about the foundation and he talks about some people build on rock and he says some people build on sand and what he said he says both people that built on rock and sand heard the words right read the words they were there for both of them the only difference between the one who builds on rock and the ones who builds on sand is he who applies that which they heard who is doing that thing that they learned about so see all of us here today we're building we are in the construction business right we're building our lives we're constructing and in all reality the only difference between your house being built on rock and sand is this are you going to do what you just learned if you say i'm going to do it right then i'm building on rock if you say well that's a good idea i'm going to think about it right i may remember it i may talk about it but i'm not going to do it in my life well you're still going to build a structure but your structure is going to be on sand. And, the, and Jesus said that when the rains come, the winds come, the storms come, and they will come in all of our lives. The only foundations that last is he who did that thing that he heard. I want this place to be filled with people who have strong foundations and are actively engaged doing what you're learning. Okay? So here's what you got to do. This week, you got to figure out, A, what's your box? What's your thing? right? If maybe it was one that we talked about today, maybe it's a new one. You got to figure out what, what, what is the lie that you're believing? What is the thing that you, is opposed to scripture that you're believing for your life? I'm hopeless. I can't escape. I'm never going to get out. Whatever it is, okay? And you need to come up with three verses that have to do with that thing. Three verses, all right? Because you got to do home. Remember, we want to build on rock. We don't want to build on sand. So now we're going to go home. We're going to find three verses that have to do with that one thing because we're refusing to continue living in this place where these things are growing opposed to the will of God inside of our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Bow your heads. God, I thank you so much for your word. Man, it's just so good. You know, your word is so good. And your word has the power to set people free. And I know that there's people, maybe even here today, that they just really want to be set free. And I know your word is the only thing that has the power to set them free. So I pray, Father, for each and every single person here today that they will live out what we talked about, that they will actively employ the skills that we're talking about in their lives. And I pray that by living according to your word, by allowing your word to come alive inside of their lives, that they will destroy the strongholds that are stealing away your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your faithfulness, your gentleness, and your self-control from growing inside of their lives. Father, I believe that you have a destiny and a great purpose for each and every single person here. 
And Father, I just want to see that purpose come to pass. Strengthen them, show them, Father, the way, and encourage them in the midst of this message and in the midst of the next days that are going to follow this. Let them apply your living word to their lives. I pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody says,